wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. Them girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha, Economo Walk is in the house. And if Welcome you to another is- episode of the New Look, uh, where we're gonna take a new look at China with the famous Bill Bishop. Uh, I can't think of another person who, I mean, you're, you're sort of like the ominous Greece bill of of China scholarship and thinking within the the policy community now. But Bill, thanks for joining us. Thank you, and uh, the, thanks for the intro. I, I think I can only disappoint your your listeners now, but thanks. No, <laughs> Pleasure no, no. To be this, here. Is, this is I, I've been a, a huge fan of your work uh, and a subscriber. Uh, to cynicism. Uh, am I saying that correctly? I, uh, uh, I actually call it cynicism. I, I, I picked the name to rhyme with cynicism, um, but either way it works. It's spelled like cynicism. Well, it, what is among China? I thought it was if I if I studied China or I was friendly to China, I was a sinophile. But is it cinephile? Um, it's probably sinophile. You know, so so I'm, I'm, it's a little it's a little mushy there. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, Bill, tell us kind of where you're from um, and uh, how you first got interested in, in China. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. So I'm actually from D.C., uh, born and raised here. And uh, uh, my dad was a journalist and he was in the uh, Carter administration for a bit of time. Um, and then he left town. Um, so I grew up never wanting to be in government or actually living here as adults because it seemed like such a crazy town. And this was back when it wasn't actually that crazy. Um, and, but I, so I went to college at, up at Middlebury in Vermont and, and that's where I started taking Chinese. And I've been a good with languages. I actually didn't really have any particular affinity with China, but I love the language. It was very challenging. And then in 1989 for my junior spring, I actually was a, um, a, on a program at Peking University where I was a, 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 a foreign student. And of course, that ended up being the spring, the Beijing spring, where um, you had the, the the beginning, the protests that began in, in late April and then went all the way through until the uh, crackdown on June 4th. And so I was there. Uh, I actually ended up working from late April until third week of June for CBS News as what they call like a fixer or translator, where I kind of went around with camera crews and schlepped gear and tried to arrange stuff and um, spent, I think, six nights sleeping on Tiananmen Square. We were on the night watch. Um, and uh, and that was a, it was a very formative experience for me because I, you know, th- back then in China in the late 80s, it was there was a lot of ferment. It was only 10 or 11 years, what, 13 years out of the Cultural Revolution. There was a lot of uh, intellectual ferment and sort of possibilities for how China was going to evolve. And it was just quite, you know, and, and I was I had taken three years of Chinese and my Chinese was terrible. I didn't ha- actually had no clue what was going on, um, but it, but it, no, but it, but it was such a, it was such a sort of deeply moving and um, experience that when I went back, I went back for a senior year at Middlebury and I, then I went to Taiwan for a year because I decided I really wanted to learn Chinese and figure out what had happened. Wow. Um, and, and so I was spent a year in Taiwan and then in 91, so 91, I graduated from college in 1990 in uh, the fall of 91, I moved to Beijing and Kind of did worked worked for uh, the Baltimore Sun. We had a bureau as like their sort of news assistant, and then I worked as a I actually worked in the the Chinese Communist Party propaganda system. I worked as a translator, at what was called the Chinese Literature Press, because they gave me my visa and housing. So I worked um, I worked for there for about fifteen months, and in, in a some of your viewers will remember him. In a weird twist of fate, when I was born, my parents, the, the house that they were renting in Chevy Chase, Maryland, that they brought me back to was actually owned by James Lilly. Um, he was off, I think then he was in South Korea. And so we we're family acquaintances. And before I went back to China, I sort of got some, asked for some advice. And he said, you know, whatever you do, don't work for the Chinese government. <laughs> which, which, of course, I, I did because, you know, actually it was hard to get a job back then. But whatever. Um, and, um, you know, so I feel like I, I survived. It was actually quite fascinating having that experience of sort of a glimpses inside the system and um, only two years after Tiananmen Square. And it was it was just a, you know, I didn't get paid very much. I don't think it corrupted me, but I found it to be extremely educational. Um, um, wait, I have a lot of questions related to that. So okay. Balt- some of them are trivial like this. Uh, the Baltimore Sun. Didn't the uh, the guy who did The Wire, David Chase, didn't he work at the Baltimore Sun? Am I getting that wrong? 
No, you're right. I didn't know. I was working for a guy oh. named Bob Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, no. But he was, and then after Bob, I think Ian Johnson worked there and Gotti Epstein, you know, they're both, there's a good, good, good crew of um, excellent journalists who work there. Fantastic. Uh, Middlebury. So I did an immersion program at Middlebury. I love Middlebury, uh, at least until they started violently attacking um, uh, conservative speakers uh, on campus. How long? Yeah, I, mean, I, Middlebury... I, I actually, I actually agree with you on that. I was, I was quite, as an alum, I was quite disappointed with the way that whole thing went down. Well, that was a that was an early glimpse of the American Cultural Revolution that's that's happening right now. But we'll plant a flag there yeah. and then come back to it. Um, Middlebury has an exceptional foreign language program. Um, but how, so you said you had done three years by the time you got to China. And even then you, you still kind of felt like you were struggling with fluency. And I'm, what I'm getting at is China's Mandarin is obviously very difficult to learn. How long did it take you from zero to fluent where you really felt confident? Um, by the time I left, so, so my, my stint in the early nineties where I was in Beijing and I was working for the Baltimore sun, Part time in this other place. Uh, I left in the uh, May of '93 to go back to SICE for two years. And when I left in May of '93, I felt like I was pretty competent in language. Uh, fluency as a foreigner is is something I think that it's it's um, uh, never really truly attainable. But it was good enough. But it was it's a it's it's multi years of academic study, but it's also really important to find uh, to be able to actually like like any language you want to actually be able to live in that the environment and immerse yourself definitely and so middlebury is great not quite the same now taiwan really is taiwan was great i spent a year in taiwan after college at, at um this iup program which is now in beijing and that was extre extremely useful for the language and then how do you how do you maintain i would imagine i mean arabic for me is perishable and if i'm not kind of reading it and, and speaking it it uh, it falls into disrepair are you are you reading uh, in Mandarin every single day. How do you maintain it on a daily basis? So I read. I read a lot. I mean, again, I, I you know, early '90s I was working as a translator, translating Chinese literature into English. Um, I, you know, my reading ability was pretty good. I, I, I think, you know, for my job for the newsletter, I, I read Chinese, you know, a few hours a day as part of what I look at. And um, speaking is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, yeah. The, the, um, but. You know, we have Chinese friends. I mean, again, we haven't really seen them since the lockdown, but um, we're playing Chinese friends in town. And I, I do watch some Chinese TV on YouTube right now. I'm on up, up to episode 33 of this um, mini series called Hunting, Liahu, which is about uh, the, these, the, the hunt for overseas fugitives. Um, Interesting. So it's, it's not quite the wire, um, but but it's actually it has like, like some big big stars in it, and it's reasonably entertaining. And you know, at least for like listening, you know, it's it's a good way to just sort of keep you know, because some people actually learn the language to watching TV. Interesting, interesting. And how did I'm about to reveal my ignorance? And I feel like I need a disclaimer at the beginning of every podcast because people think because I spent a lot of time working on U.S. China issues that I somehow know something about it, and I don't because. I'm a Middle East guy. Well, the only thing I do is read your newsletter every morning so I can stay reasonably informed. How does it work in terms of dialects? Because uh, Arabic is exceptionally difficult because there's the, the sort of the classical formal Arabic, the Fasa, and then what's called the Amiya, which is the dialects. And there's so many different dialects. So I went to the Middle East pretty good at the formal, but I didn't know what the heck was going on when I was in Iraq because they spoke a dialect I didn't understand. Is there a similar phenomenon in China? There, there is. I mean, there's absolutely a whole bunch of dialects. The written language is for the most part the same. Uh, the the standard um, the Putonghua the, the Hong Kong is a little bit different um, where the written written Cantonese actually has some variances um, but you know the the PRC certainly the 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 the, the, the Chinese government has um, since since 1949 you know they they've made a a, a, a huge effort at um, ensuring or trying to ensure at least that everybody there was a common language because obviously language is also part of a common identity. Um, and so, but you can certainly end up in places in China where you think you have good Mandarin and you have no idea what they're saying. And, and so you still have, you know, obviously down in Southern China, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Shanghai, all sorts of places are all sorts of dialects. And then there's dialects and there, then there's sort of kind of, um, different accents. And so it's, I don't think it's as bad and as bad as say, say Arabic, but, um, it, there are places you could go in, in mainland China still where basically people really some places it's really hard to actually communicate. 
Um, and then how did the idea for cynicism uh, come about? Uh, when did you start it? And just take us through the evolution of that. Sure. So, so I actually, so, so after, you know, I went to SICE, I did China studies, I graduated in 1995. And um, I ended up, I actually wanted to go in foreign service, but they had canceled all the tests that year. <laughs> um, and so, so I ended, it worked out, right? So I ended up um, out in California at a company doing financial data with a China business because the, the owner was the father of a guy going to college with. And like, oh, we need somebody who speaks Chinese. And so they had, a, it was a bad business, but we ended up um, uh, sort of starting this company called MarketWatch.com, which is still alive. It was, just, it was a internet startup for financial data, financial news. Um, and anyway, so so did that. Dow Jones bought it in 2005, 2004, 2005. And um, I then went back to China in 2005 to do a, another startup around online video games. And that was a complete disaster. Lost a ton of money. Uh, lost lost a lot of my dignity. I mean, just it was it was awful. I mean, it's great to be a successful entrepreneur. It's it's also it sucks to fail. And yeah. um, so while after had, that had failed, my my wife is also an entrepreneur, and she had started a business. And we had two little kids. So I was sort of stay at home dad, but I was bored and I was, you know, obviously reading the news and Twitter was just getting started and blogging was kind of just starting. So I started a blog and I just kind of occasionally wrote about stuff. And then I said, OK, you know, there's like a lot of stuff going on. And so I started like a daily digest I post on my blog. And then in 2012, uh, a Chinese friend of mine who at the time was one of the top um, people on Weibo, you know, the sort of the Chinese Twitter like thing. She had, I think at the time, four or five million followers. She posted a link to my blog saying this is really useful. And I had the most traffic ever for like three hours. And then I got, got blocked by the Great Firewall. And I've been blocked since then. <laughs> and so, and so then, I mean, this is a long way, but then actually, thanks to the Great Firewall, I turned it into an email newsletter because that was the only way that, you know, they weren't blocking email. And then it sort of evolved in fits and starts. And when we moved back to DC in 2015, you know, I was I was trying to figure out what to do and had been doing some consulting, wasn't really sure. Um, you know, we what wasn't wasn't really and I'm too old for someone to hire me, right? It's just sort of like I had no, I mean, you know, I had to I had to like figure out how to how to start a business. And and um so I just was some some talking to some friends who were already doing related stuff, it just sort of fit that I try this out and it kind of hit the moment in terms of both technology and kind of the consumer acceptance of paying for stuff. And then as well, of course, is, you know, the everyday China gets, it's a bigger story and it's a more complicated and more important story. And so it kind of all flowed together and um, just incredibly fortunate to be able to, to be able to do it and be able to do it from, from, you know, from home now. I wish, you know, I, I miss going back to China. I haven't back to China for 17 months, I think. And that, um, I don't know. Well, obviously, no one's going back to China right now, but um, it, it is challenging. It, it is challenging to do this. All it's just sort of rooted here now. It's also challenging. I mean, you know, there's it's 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 a struggle to avoid kind of the the group think. I mean, you have the Beijing group think, then you have the DC group think, yeah. and so it's it's a it's a challenge. Well, that actually is a perfect transition point. I think. I mean, the goal of this podcast, if, at least for me, is to I'm trying to connect sort of things that people that are in the D.C. foreign policy bubble talk about to Northeast Wisconsin, hence hence the, the title NEW, New, New Look Podcast. It's also an allusion to Eisenhower's foreign policy. So, and I, I really want your help in kind of explaining to my constituents, my employers in Northeast Wisconsin, why China matters. Um, but I don't know where to start, right? And, and maybe maybe we could start with We'll, we just passed what was the 31st anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Um, right. Given that you were there, uh, you know, when it all went down, what what should Wisconsinites know about that? Why is it important for Wisconsinites to know about that? About, about Tiananmen Square? Well, I mean, Tiananmen it, it Square, is, yeah. it, it, I think, you know, Tiananmen Square, 1989, it was 13 years, not quite actually 13 years after Mao Zedong had died. Um, you know, China was just coming out of actually had normalized diplomatic relations with the U.S. for just 10 years when Tiananmen Square happened. Uh, it was an era where there was a lot more, I think, a lot more hope and, and sort of willingness to consider much broader spectrum of ideas in China. And there was also a lot more hope 
in the U.S.-China relationship. And I think that is where, you know, the mid-80s were really the kind of the beginnings of this, um, where the sort of the idea of engagement policy really started to take off. And fast forward, though, you know, you look back now 30 years and, you know, after the after the, the crackdown in, in 1989, there was sort of a lot of commentary saying, oh, you know, the communists, they can't they can't stay in power. You know, it's all a house of cards. It's going to fall apart. You know, the new leader, Jiang Zemin, is a flower pot. He basically ran the country for 15 years, thereabouts. It's a pretty impressive flower pot. But um, and so. So there, but 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 what I think we now we realize is is how fundamental that crackdown was to the evolution of what the Communist Party has become. And so, in question of why does it matter, I mean, it's it's a long answer. First of all, obviously, jobs, right? I mean, I don't know if is your district. Do you have any of the ginseng farmers, the American no. ginseng? So that's a big export of Wisconsin to China, right? It's actually this kind of what's called American ginseng which is a, the, a sort of a Chinese medicine. There's obviously dairy. I don't know if, how much dairy you guys export. Um, the, but, you know, in terms of, in terms of broader, why, why does it matter? It, it goes back to sort of where we are now in the relationship with China and, and, and sort of how uh, the Trump administration, President Trump and his team have, have and, and obviously you, you guys on the Hill, sort of reshaping or reframing the way America wants to have a relationship with China, a lot of it goes back to the, the choice that the Communist Party leadership made in 1989, where they, they could have chosen not necessarily, you know, hey, guys, we're a liberal democracy, but we're going to take a sort of a, a more of a um, sort of evolutionary liberal approach to how we evolve and develop the country and reform the country. And instead, they went to, to a much harsher, um, more authoritarian road which had had it which had its fits and starts over the last 30 years but clearly the general trend was intact and then now since 2012 under under xi jinping um they sort of have this confluence of china of a, a much uh harsher uh kind of old school leader in xi jinping who also has the wealth and the the tools and the military to now be um you know, a near superpower and second biggest economy in the world in a country that is has a, uh, you know, is, is run by an ideology that is frankly, you know, quite hostile to to America and has as its values things that are values that are quite inimical to to what I think we would consider to be um, the vision of what America's values are. Well, how did we how did we miss that? I mean, despite the crackdown, despite I think the conventional arms embargo came after the crackdown, would it be fair to say we largely continued a uh, I don't know what the right term would be accommodationist uh, integrationist approach, you know, obviously culminating in China's accession to the WTO. I think the responsible stakeholder theory was the bipartisan sort of consensus. But if what you're saying is true, we should have seen back in 89 that this was actually we were misreading the Chinese Communist Party. How, how did we misread it? Well, so, I mean, obviously, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, I, I think yeah. that, I mean, there were some people who didn't misread it. And even some of the people who were pushing, really pushing hard on engagement didn't misread it. But it was seen, I think, as the, as the best policy choice at the time. The way I look at the whole engagement, did it fail or not, you know, debate is, you know, and I'm kind of a, a, a child of engagement, right? I got involved in China, right? It's sort of the, you know, the, the budding, you know, right before the Tiananmen Crack down, and it was really the, a very much a heyday in some ways of the engagement sort of concept. Is generally the idea was right because we, you know, when China, it's much better to have China inside the tent than outside the tent. And I think though where things fell down is we kept finding in various politicians and lobbying business business groups, business lobbies, we kept finding excuses for why okay it's not happening now but it'll happen later and, and and we sort of persisted in this engagement view without putting in enough guardrails or checkpoints to say well wait a minute are, are they actually evolving the way we expect them to and if not are there ways to impose costs or do things to try and modify or shape the behavior and in many ways i think that's where we collectively fell down and it's totally bipartisan it's not just the political class it's business totally. and but at the same time it goes back to the question of what was the other choices where we just said shut down in 1989 and we never, we said, China, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to trade with you. We're not going to have diplomatic relations. So you change. I mean, that 
probably wouldn't have worked either. And so that's well, the challenge. Were some, some choices in the early 50s we could have made too, you know, but right. Th- right. those were very apocalyptic too. Um, well, but I, so just for me, let me confess my own, my own view of this, which is uh, I think started to turn in my mind in 2015 when I uh, got a notification from OPM that my own military records have been hacked. And I started to think like, okay, what's going on here? Like, this is a right. pretty, you know, ballsy move for uh, for Xi Jinping to pull this off. And then why is Obama inviting him to the White House? Then Obama goes to, where did he go? Was it Hangzhou for the G20 summit? And they and do the whole thing. he walks out of the, the butt of the airplane. Yeah, the butt of the airplane. And what was crazy to me was, I mean, everyone rightly made an issue of that. But almost simultaneously, I think they were sending vessels to the Scarborough Shoal to challenge the Philippines to like, you know, uh, yeah. control that area. And so I just started to think like, I'm clearly missing something here. Something's going on in China. And so I turned to some of our mutual friends foremost among the Matt Pottinger to get educated. But when do you think this all started to shift? When, at least in America, we started to think, okay, engagement is not working. Something different's going on here. So I think, you know, during the Obama administration, there were people like, like Secretary of State Clinton at the time who were actually quite uh, clear-eyed about China. And I think that, um, you know, it, 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 I think it also, though, in the Obama administration, because, because really, I think one of, the, one of the other really important turning points is um, for the Chinese side is one was the second Iraq war, um, mm. where on the one hand, they were shocked and, shocked and awed by the U.S. military power and technology. On the other hand, they realized they looked that, you know, as we became distracted in the Middle East, we opened up a whole bunch of space for China to do all sorts of stuff. And and then the financial crash, right, where where we in the U.S., you know, we we nearly crashed the world. And I think that that gave there there been, you know, there's obviously contending contending, you know, schools of thought in China about the U.S. and global relate global you know, international developments like any country. And the crash really empowered and energized the folks who were not pushing, who, who were saying, wait a minute, we shouldn't, you know, the U.S. is not the right model in some areas to follow. And, and so that really, I think, said, hey, you know, it, it emboldened this idea that there's a third way for the Communist Party to develop the economy and run their economy. And so, and it also, I think, really started to fuel this, this as our, time in the Middle East extended and, you know, we, we expended a lot of um, blood and treasure, as you know, personally, I think it, it, we look to the Chinese or some of the Chinese as sort of an exhausted declining empire. And so there's a school of thought, especially after the um, financial crash, it really started coming and thinking that, OK, the U.S. is in terminal decline. Now, I'm not saying we are, but I'm saying that that's how I think that that's 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 certainly an argument that has a lot of um, traction in in parts of parts of the power structure in china is, and so is, do you think that she is that she's view and is this, is this i think related, I mean, it's not just she's approach? view but i do think i do think it's she's view which i think is that you know the and it's it's the whole it's you know she's a very proud chinese nationalist right when you know when he when he came his the first speech he made in 2012 in november when he was general secretary in his speech he mentioned i think it was three or four times very clearly this sort of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And that's not a new term, but he clearly came in with much more rooted emphasis on that. And then we see that eight years later, how it's, and this idea of this, this, this rejuvenation is basically, it's the cliched, but true, China resumes its rightful place in the world, which is as effectively the center of the world, right? And, you know, we're not there yet. And maybe in this era, that's not really where they're going to get, but it's this general idea of restoring past, glory and power, you know, the, the, the past glories and power of the of the Chinese nation. And so you, I think you have that, you have the U.S., which is distracted, and you have, I think, a, um, uh, a worldview or an, an approach to doing things in the Communist Party at the top level, including with Xi Jinping, which is very hard and very much they're going to push until they hit something. And the U.S. approach certainly for for a long time was kind of to sort of sort of shift or kind of move around instead of basically saying, you know, stop. And as and, and, and I think that's where like the South China Sea, you know, you would know I, I was told by somebody in the um, 
in the defense establishment when they about the building of the islands, right? The, the fake islands in the South China Sea is that, you know, because I said, I mean, we must have had imagery. We must have seen what was happening. Right. And the answer was, Scott was, you know, it was kind of interesting. We we saw them doing something and we weren't sure what. And then they stopped. And then we didn't say anything. And then a couple months later or a few months later, they just started again. And then we said, well, maybe they were waiting to see if he would say anything. And we didn't say anything. Right. And, and so I think fundamentally, and that's where I think, you know, this, where, where the Trump administration, you know, again, I, I agree with the general diagnosis. I think, you know, I have some issues with how they've approached China, but I think the general approach of basically saying, you know what, this, some of this stuff just isn't OK. It has to stop is actually the only thing. And this is it's a very unfortunate dynamic that the Communist Party has set up. But that's the only thing that actually gets their attention. Yeah. So this is kind of the Leninist, you know, probe with bayonets. If you hit steel, you stop. If you hit push, you it's push. Exactly, it's exactly yeah. what it is. And, and that's how, I mean, I, you know, the last time I was in China, I lived in Beijing for 10 years. And, you know, the, the Communist Party has just, the, the, they've changed the culture inside China so that that's how basically society is ordered. It's basically, I'm above you, I can kick you down. I'm below you, I have to kiss your, kiss your rear end. It's a, it's a very, and, and that dynamic permeates society but it also permeates and it permeates domestic politics. So there, I, I, there's no reason it doesn't also permeate how they approach the world. And we're seeing, certainly seeing that in the way they're going out with like these crazy wolf warrior, you know, diplomats, et cetera. Okay. We got to come back to wolf warrior. Cause I need to get your help on that. Um, my, my wife is making a guest appearance on the hi, honey. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but okay, in terms of what she's, what they're pushing, for and I, I have trouble explaining this, like why why this matters. Do you have a view on is she? I, I think there's sort of two schools of thought in the China scholar community. One is that they want regional dominance or regional hegemony, and the other is that they want sort of global hegemony. But even those are amorphous concepts. What do you, what do you think they're after? What is she's actual goal? You know, by 2050, let's say, what does he want the world to look like? Uh, well, I think you said he wants China, you know, returning to the center stage, you know, the center stage. I think, you know, the, the, the regional dominance to global influence, they're not separate. They're very much related. I think mm -hmm. on the regional side, it's very much figure out ways to undermine, break up the U.S. alliance structure in Asia, make sure that the PRC is effectively the, the primary hegemon in their near neighborhood in Asia. Um, so that effectively means pushing the U.S. not completely out, but but reducing significantly the U.S. influence. And, you know, I think the U.S. gets Hawaii, gets after Hawaii. And then after Hawaii, it's it's basically the, a PRC lake with a few sort of exceptions. Um, <laughs> and so that includes but, Taiwan. And would that be but Taiwan, a absolutely, I mean, Taiwan? Absolutely. The, the, the great rejuvenation is not happening without, um, you know, reunifying, as they say, uh, with, you know, reunifying Taiwan or they used to say liberating Taiwan. Right. At what, and at what cost? They are. I mean, I think they have for many years not they, they would prefer not to have a, a military confrontation. Um, the because it's it would they would, I think, in many ways become a prior nation if they took Taiwan by force. They might actually not win um, or they might not win that easily. Uh, but when you look at what's happening in Hong Kong and you look at sort of how the Taiwan electorate and Taiwan citizens have been voting and, and polling and how they see mainland China, you know, the, the idea of some sort of a peaceful reunification where the Taiwanese go willingly is completely off the table. And so that then raises the question, OK, if 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 Xi Jinping's vision of sort of the great rejuvenation does include Taiwan, then there really is only way he one way he gets it back. Interesting. And, and, so, and, I, and so that's sorry. I rudely interrupted you when you were explaining how those regional goals where they relegate us to vacationing in Hawaii, if we're lucky, relate to sort of broader global goals that they well, have. Well, so, so I think what you're seeing, I mean, you know, that it, it's not again, you're also seeing, though, already a very uh, robust um, and in many ways successful effort to expand their global influence. Obviously, a big part of it is economic power, and they're doing that with things like the Belt and Road Initiative and, you know, where they're and, and they've done a very good job of binding countries to the Chinese economy. I think I, I saw a statistic. I think now that China is the number one uh, trading partner of 120 something countries around the world. 
Um, and so, you know, that's why you see like the, 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 the prime minister of Singapore writing in foreign affairs last week or a couple weeks ago about how they, they don't want to make a choice. They don't want to be in a position where they have to choose between China and the U.S. because they're, you know, China is, is too important for Singapore. So is the U.S., right? So they're, but, but so in terms of global influence, they've done it. They've done a very good job by, um, uh, you know, there's the law, there's a debate about do they want to overthrow the international system like they did in the Mao era? And I think the answer is no, but they want to reshape it to what to something that is much more accommodating to the the authoritarian nature of and the values of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's why it's very important for them to have, um, you know, PRC diplomat, PRC citizens heading, you know, as many UN agencies as they can get. Um, it, and, and in many ways, it's working right. In many ways, they, they have. You know, they've, they've done, they've been masterful at using the international system to their own goals. And now they're, I think, very good or been quite good at then shaping from the inside. And so the argument to me, there's this sort of like, you know, very spirited debate about what are, you know, is China trying to, you know, change the international system or, you know, it's like, it, it basically, I think they want an international system with Chinese characteristics, which the framework might actually be the same as it is now or similar to the WTO, WHO, mm. the UN system. But they're inside the tent, and if they can then sort of gut it and reshape it while keeping the framework, is that changing the international system or not? To me, it's like an academic question. Of course, they've changed it, and that I think is what, and that that I think is is at least from what I see, that's pretty clear what they're doing, and that's actually much smarter for the Chinese because they can take, and this is you know, they take the good, and then they figure out how to reshape what they think is detrimental to them. But it but it goes back to the earlier question of why does it matter? So one of the things China is doing that's related to sort of the international system is, you know, China obviously has a very restricted um, information environment, censorship, especially Internet censorship. And and they are increasingly extending that model globally, both through um, selling the actual infrastructure pieces that allow other countries to build their own kind of great firewall regulated intranet for their countries, but then also trying to reshape the norms of speech globally and and they're doing it in some way like for example i mean this is this is a you know one simple case but i'm glad we're using skype not zoom i'm trying not to use Zoom anymore because because of zoom's ties to china their their presence their engineering presence in china you know they are they were caught censoring globally for the chinese communist party you know where they over the Tiananmen square stuff where they shut down accounts of i think three people who were in the U.S. based, there were two in the U.S., one in Hong Kong, who were running uh, Zoom meetings, and the Chinese authorities knew about the meetings. You can wonder why some were advertised, but there are probably other ways they knew too, and told the company that they they didn't want these meetings to happen. Wait, so how does that work in practice? So does some CCP official like go to the Zoom rep in China and say? So- so that's why yesterday in my, new, in my newsletter, I actually have a list of 12 questions for Zoom to ask how it worked. Because for the Chinese internet companies, it's very common. Most, like the big Chinese internet companies, like a, like a Tencent or a Baidu, they actually, and Alibaba, they actually have a police station, an internet police station in their offices, right? Because it's just, it's just the way things work, right? And um, that's a very I mean, Orwellian phrase, internet police station. <laughs> well, they have, they have, I mean, they have a cyber, you know, they, that, they have internet police. And, and so, um, and so the, the question for Zoom then, and, and something they didn't disclose, and I don't think they're going to disclose, is how exactly how does that work? So they said they said they were doing it in accordance with PRC law. And, you know, look, if you're operating inside China and like in, inside any country, you have to op- you have to abide by that law. The problem is when PRC law, they're trying to apply it or it's being applied globally, which is basically what happened in this case. Right. And wow. so the question, though, for Zoom is. How were you contacted? Which PRC organization contacted your company? Whom at your company did they contact? Do you have a existing process for how you handle requests from PRC ser- security services about your operations? You know, that, that kind of stuff is actually really important for, for that co- the company to answer, given how it's almost omnipresent now in the U.S. I mean, my kids use it at their school for remote learning, right? I mean, I, I have my weekly happy hour with my high school friends on Zoom. I don't really care about that, but I care about, you know, I, I've been on, their, you know, political campaigns are running meetings on Zoom. There, there yeah. are think tanks that are in D.C. that are running meetings on their RAM meetings on Zoom that included representatives of the intelligence community. I mean, you just, 
it's not safe. And as I understand it, so Zoom's vulnerability in this case, or the leverage the CCP has over Zoom is because a lot of their engineers are based in China, correct? So I think part, a, a piece of it is absolutely they, they have a very large engineering operation in China. The other bit is they've been trying to keep Zoom unblocked in China. That they're, they're trying to make it so that Zoom is accessible to Chinese people too. And that's a good thing. I mean, the, the problem here, Zoom isn't the Zoom has made some mistakes, but the bad actor actually isn't Zoom. The bad actor is the is the actual is the is the regime that's censoring this information and forcing, you know, effectively, you know, we talk about decoupling, but effectively information decoupling. We're basically saying, you know, you can only talk about when it when it comes to China, you can only talk about things we approve. Because to the to your earlier question about sort of China and shaping sort of the international system. One thing that, and this this also predates Xi Jinping, but of course, it, like a lot of things, it's gotten much more intense under him. Is China for for many years has wanted to, what they what they call um, is increase their global discourse power, meaning they want to increase sort of the the party's ability to shape how China is talked about globally, and and initially it was primarily the Chinese language, but but over the last few years we've seen it much more. In any language, so where basically they want to be able to shape conversations about China here, Brussels, Australia, Tokyo, pick a place. And it's not just previously; it was really more focused on the um, what they call the Chinese diaspora, the tens of millions of, of, of ethnic Chinese around the world. Again, now it's it's a much more of a global effort, and that's something that um, you know again. We're obviously living in an interesting time with you know social media and and sort of all the all the craziness that's going on globally anyway. And we saw you know with Russia, China, but the Chinese are in many ways, I think, are going to be much more of a longer term problem than say, for example, the Russians because they're just they have a better story to tell and they're much more sophisticated. And would it be fair to say that one of the things she has done is study the demise of the Soviet Union and derive some very important lessons from that. I know you you've promoted John Garno's speech on engineers of the soul and things like that. I mean, what do you think those lessons that he derives are? And I guess the sub question is, I, is ideology a big part of this or does the party just graft ideology as it suits on top of their practical aims, which are more about maintaining power and expanding power internationally, if that makes sense? It does, and the answer is yes. They do both. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. But but so yeah. um, in, in terms of the lessons from the fall of the Soviet Union, I mean, they, there is there's been a massive project inside the Communist Party to learn those lessons. She himself is 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 said to be um, quite the fancies himself quite the historian, um, and so the lessons. I mean, some you know there. I think this is David Shaw. There's there have been books written about the lessons, but some of the key ones were basically um, one. You know, the Soviet Union had let the party become a na let the army become a national army instead of a party. So the PLA actually the PLA is a party army. So that means it listens to the party. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't. It's, it's and two is, you know, the and the in the in the Gorbachev era in the Soviet Union there had been a um, a real flowering of ideas and they sort of they they kind of lost control or they'd allowed other sort of what do they call Sami stats like sort of other media and, and sort of thinking to, and, and speech to get a little bit out of control. And so that's why, the, you know, one of the lessons here is, you know, the, the party, you know, ideology propaganda work is one of the key pillars of the Communist Party control. And so one of the lessons was that that control has to be reinforced, strengthened and become, um, you know, basically become omnipresent, almost omnipresent. The other bit was party discipline. And that's where I think you see you know that we've all heard about the, the the corruption crackdown that she started in 2012 and in 2012 um it, it's around it's around corruption it's around political rivalry it's also around party discipline it's a little bit it's a bit around ideology but it goes back to this idea that the the, the, the soviet union the, the 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 soviet union party the communist party had become um completely you know dis dissolute flaccid corrupt and that that then allowed the sort of evil Western influences to infiltrate and take it down. And so we in the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, these are the things we have to watch for, which is why, you know, you see a lot of talk about the hostile foreign forces. You know, again, you know, my view, my understanding is, and again, this is a point of argument and contention of some scholars is, you know, 
people say, oh, China's not the enemy. I think there was a big open letter last year about China's not the enemy. You know, the Communist Party sees us as the enemy, as best I can tell. I mean, yeah. they, they don't they don't want to have a war with us, but they see the U.S. as a fundamental threat to their existence. And, you know, so much of what they do is around dealing you know, trying to deal with that. And so that, but that goes back into your, your question about the, what the lessons for the Soviet Union, the lessons are, you know, the U S was actually a, you know, the Soviet Union has problems, but then the U S was out there as a separate, very um, attractive model of ideas and, you know, prosperity for Russian, for Soviet citizens. Yeah. And so, and so again, that's another bit where, you know, where we are now, one of the things that Xi Jinping and the Chinese have done a pretty good job of is, is, you know, when it comes to the sort of comparisons with sort of how the Soviet Union fell, right now we're not looking so hot. Like, like it's not 19, the late 1980s that the, the U.S. was much more attractive than the Soviet Union. I think that the Communist Party through a variety of means and then through some bits of reality, we're, don't, you know, we're not like up here looking so great. We're kind of like, hey, a lot yeah. of Chinese people, you know, a lot, again, a lot of Chinese people are like, eh, you know, it's not great here, but you guys don't look so great either. And the party, well, the guys party uses that to its advantage. Well, it's funny, like on your point about well, uh, that they see us as the enemy. It wasn't until I wa actually watched Wolf Warrior 1 and 2 on YouTube that I realized that 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 message like probably resonates widely in China. Right. Like, in other words, she has to be giving a lot of people what they want in terms of unleashing his wolf warriors around the world to stick it to the US and every other country. They're they very think. popular. Like like yeah. the like this foreign ministry spokesman Zhou Li Tian who, you know, who's the sort of the start of the, the, the had the tweet about like maybe it came from Fort Detrick, you know, the virus. He's got like fan pages. You know, he's super popular. And but but you know, I mean the thing the thing is is, you know, and again, like Last year, especially at the worst parts of the trade war negotiations, when things got bad, what is CCTV, you know, the, 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 the main central broadcaster? They start showing movies of like Korean war battles where the Chinese are killing Americans. Yeah, and, you know, and, and people, you know, write that off. Oh, that's just like the normal propaganda stuff. But somebody at a senior level is thinking this is a good idea. Totally. And so from my view, you know, I mean, my job, right, is I spend a lot of time looking at Chinese propaganda, Chinese media, and, you know, and so, you know, I, maybe I'm too much into it. But for me, it's like, okay, if this is what they're showing their population, yes, we can just dismiss it as, you know, whatever, old school, some crazy person. But, you know, I'm not sure, given our history of sort of assuming, the, you know, the whole sort of engagement and they're going to change and they must have to liberalize, I think... I'm, I'm a big believer of sort of listening to what they're saying and, 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 and paying attention to what they're writing as opposed to trying to graft on our hopes and desires to what we think they're doing. Well, you you often link to these amazing cartoons where they're like ripping on Pompeo. I don't know if Pottinger has been the subject of a cartoon, but it's oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, I most people called a weasel. Pottinger has been referred to as a weasel, but he has. I don't think it was actually been that was his call that. sign in the Marine Corps. It was weasel. W so. Was it? OK, no, no, it was. I think it was China, actually. China six. Um, no, Pottinger. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Pompeo is. I mean, I think it's it's almost a daily thing where he's and he attacks them. So it's, it's just this like crazy yeah. dynamic. And and it's the vitriol, though, is actually um, I mean, you kind of want to laugh sometimes just the way it's like, the, the, but, but it's, but it, it, but it's not funny because it's a sign of sort of where we are in the relationship and yeah. really the, the mutual, the mutual contempt at, at, at certain very senior levels that we have towards each other that, that, you know, is, um, it's just, it's a, it's a sign of the times, but it's also, I think, um, it's worrisome for sort of where the trajectory of the relationship is going. Well, on that note, I mean, I think you, you said earlier, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you like you agree with the overall approach the Trump administration has taken, at least having to take a harder line. But there's probably a lot of areas where you disagree. Where would you where are your primary disagreements? Well, you think I, I, I suspect you might agree with the premise of the national security strategy and national defense strategy, but have some disagreements with the way it's been implemented vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think the, the, the real issue, and, and it's, it's sort of, um, 
what's a bit of a heresy in DC, I think in some places to say this, is that as, 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 as big and powerful as we are in the US, we're not big and powerful enough to actually take this, take on this challenge with China alone. And so we can mm. lead and we can, we can push. And I think the Trump administration has always been pushing hard, but we, it is not going to work if we are not working closely with our key allies. And the, the stuff where like, you know, basically we're, we're, we're effectively extorting money from South Korea for bases, or we're pulling, you know, we're threatening to withdraw troops from Germany, or we're putting tariffs on these key allies who are, are coming to their own conclusions about China that are increasingly in line with where the U.S. has been for the last couple of years is, is if we could create, you know, a some sort of a, you know, to use the Chinese term, the united front. That's what China worries about. China love China. China, I think that the leadership is is of mixed minds about President Trump. On the one hand, they hate him because he's been tougher than any president either rhetorically and in, on trade. On the other hand, he creates incredible space for China because of the way he also um, stresses our own allies. And so, if the if we were able to really work to to bring to, to create a broader coalition. To, to sort of address China, I think that would help. You're part of that parliamentary alliance, right? Yeah. Is, isn't that right? I mean, that's a, and, and I just saw it now. And, a, like, and a, a secret club of of uh, a few, a, a UK legislator and an Australian legislator. That's basically us on Signal just exchanging ideas every single day. Oh, good. Well, but, but so that, but that actually, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of, I think, you're doing what I think we're talking about, which is, how do we, you know, we have a group of like-minded countries. How do we figure out ways to coordinate policy and work together? And but you're seeing like Huawei, which is interesting, right? Because Huawei was, you know, obviously the U.S. has been pushing hard for. I mean, actually, I think it was the Australians who started it, right? It basically said the, um, uh, you know, we're not using Huawei, and they told the rest of Five Eyes you shouldn't use Huawei. And the U.S. got on board, but obviously other countries have been slow. It seems like, though, actually countries are coming around. Like the UK is a very interesting case where the UK has had a fundamental shift in the last couple of months. And it's, it's a large part, I think, because of, the, of COVID-19. Um, it's also because of these wolf warriors in the way that basically if China now, if they don't get what they want, they, they effectively threaten you. I mean, in some ways, China is actually doing our diplomacy for us with the way these guys are, 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 are beating on some of these countries. It's almost like if we were to sit back and just kind of let the Chinese go, they'd piss off so many more of these countries. We could just come in and it would actually be easier for us. <laughs> I think the Germans, there was at least a moment, too, when in the Bundestag there there was like a, a little quiet revolt on, on 5G that was headed in our direction. So I definitely think we have an opportunity there. Yeah. I love the idea of and I've seen it in a variety of your comments in your newsletter about we need our own united front work to counter Chinese United Front Work. Could you explain for our tens of listeners what United Front Work is? Sure. So I, I'm, not, I'm not talking, I'm not actually saying we need something like the Communist Party has, but the Communist Party actually has a specific agency called the United Front Work Department, which is um, started, you know, the, the Communist Revolution, which was a way to um, work with, work over, co-opt, um, unite, non-communist party members and groups and different different groups and and classes within society and it's it's heavily domestic focused but it also then also has a foreign component where they work both through um over you know sort of overseas chinese groups some overseas chinese groups that are that are effectively co-opted or part of the united front um as well as targeting uh, opinion makers, influential people in all sorts of countries and figuring out ways to um, effectively, you know, get them to come around to sort of being willing to see or advocate for certain positions that the Communist Party or the, China, or the PRC thinks are thinks are beneficial. There's a great report that came out from uh, Australian think tank. I think for was it the it was by a guy named Alex Josky that came out earlier this week about the United Front, which is a which is a very good sort of in-depth look at how it works. I think the focus is Australia, but there's some about Canada, there's some about here. I'm not talking about sort of this mass mobilization of different elements of society. And, but, but, you know, at the same time, and, and this is where it gets interesting, right, is because is, you have that op-ed about, you know, we're in a new Cold War. I mean, when you, when you look at, you know, we, 
I don't know if what we call it, but the, you know, it's 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 different from the first Cold War for lots of reasons. Well, push a, push back on it. Well, I, no, I, no, I, I mean, I, think, but, but I, I I push back. I mean, in the sense that that we're we're you know, China again, it goes back to the China is the leading trading partner for 120 something countries. You know, we're how, how you know the your constituents, some of your constituents have jobs that depend on China. We're much yeah. more inter, economically intertwined and bound with China than we ever were with the Soviet Union. But what I was going to say is. Back in the Cold War era, the U.S. government, other allied governments, obviously were were had had all sorts of programs, some you know overt, some covert, some clandestine, to influence things in in countries that were quote unquote contested between, say, the U.S. and the Soviet bloc or the Soviet Union. And so, you know, those are you ask about lessons. I think those are lessons that the Chinese have learned. And the question oh. is, is, do we in the U.S. government and, and some of our allied governments, are, are we, do we still have that capacity? And are those things that, you know, short answer is no. We never know about it, but are those things that we need to be uh, looking at? As, and so that's not quite the end in front, but it's clearly ways to, to influence um, not just by, you know, not just sort of necessarily overtly but but the, i mean that that's we are in that kind of struggle with china i think whether we want to be here or not i just my only point is there's something in between hot war which you want to avoid and doing nothing i'm open yeah. to a better term I, I agree. No, i'm with you yeah. i'm with you too is it is it like the lukewarm war is it the yeah I mean, that's it's, right it, it's, it's 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 something but it but it's an important for me it, it's important that, that the discussions out there, because because I you know and one it's one of the reasons, sort of where I've ended up on the newsletter, and it is is it's it's important to have this out there that th this is a much more I think of a fundamental struggle. This isn't just another sort of th this is this is and this is something that you know, she you know people say oh it's all because of the Trump administration you know there's a lot of Trump derangement syndrome out there. And, you know, for the record, I'm, I'm, I don't support the president, but, you know, that's okay. My point, though, back to saying... Yeah, I, we got to shut this podcast down. Yeah, yeah, yeah got, No, no, I agree with a lot. I agree with a lot of what he... The, the China policy is. But I think one of the problems I see in sort of the way the discussion goes around the U.S. policy towards China is blaming President Trump. It's all Trump's fault. Xi Jinping deserves far more credit or blame for where we are today than, than the U.S. government does. It, it's just... He has taken China in a direction that is so fundamentally um, opposed to us and what we believe in that we can't, and so many other allies, that there's, we can't not react. And so I was glad to see you, you set up this alliance. I think, so whatever it is, well, someone will come up with the right term. You know, one thing, if, if I can give one sort of policy um, uh, sort of wish list, it is... Yeah. More discussion, because when I talked earlier about how China is trying to, you know, they, they, for a long time, they wanted to increase their global discourse power, right, about telling the China story globally. And they've done that through, you know, they, they have their CCTN global TV cable network, and they have big bureaus all over the world. They distribute their wire service, Xinhua, globally. Um, they spend millions of dollars on inserts in English language or foreign language papers all around the world, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, et cetera. The, the best, the, the, the key platforms or the key distribution channels for the Communist Party telling its story are Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Amer so, so we're in this really ironic place where for them to, to really achieve this goal of in, increasing their global discourse power and telling the China story better, they rely on American social media platforms. And... That, I think, needs to be talked about a lot more. And I'm not necessarily saying we ban them completely, but there needs to be, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussion around sort of speech on Twitter and Facebook. And do you, do you, you know, sense, do you fact sort of check and fact check or mark politicians? And, you know, they've started, Twitter did a little bit on um, like some of these Wolf Warrior diplomats, uh, YouTube lists, like, like the CCTV, CCTN, it says it's state, state sponsored but if we're if we're in this mode where we're saying okay this is a cold war i mean can you imagine letting the soviet union basically push its global information efforts over yes, american sir. platforms right i mean but that's that's if we're going down that route then that's what we're doing yeah um well i the the, the standard that i put out there and i don't there's probably things i'm not understanding is 
why wouldn't Twitter just say, if, if you're a government official in a government that doesn't allow your citizens access to this platform, we're not going to allow you on the platform. I don't know. Just at Jack. I've tried. I, I, I've tried. I've, I've written that too. I've sent it to people on Twitter. I, I, it's, it's a, it's a... Sli slide into my DMs at Jack. Let's talk about this. Uh, <laughs> same, okay. with, same with Zuckerberg and same with the people on YouTube. I mean, and, that, and that's the thing, like this whole talk about reciprocity about the journalists, because obviously, you know, the U.S. has tossed some Chinese journalists, the Chinese have expelled a bunch of U.S. journalists, and then the Chinese whine about how we're being unfair and have this Cold War mentality, and it's not reciprocal. Again, the Chinese media is effectively operating freely in the U.S., broadcasting, distributing throughout the country with very little restrictions. What U.S. media is 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 broadcasting or publishing into the Chinese market. Interesting. None. That, exactly. Uh, that's such a critical point. Can I ask, I, I want to ask one more substance question and then we'll have a, a lightning round of fun stuff before we close. Sure. Uh, right now we're in a weird situation where both Biden and Trump are attacking each other for being weak on China. I, I like, obviously a lot of that's political uh, or mostly. Do you think there will be meaningful policy uh, fault lines on China in this election? Or in what ways will, do you think the Biden camp will kind of try and return to the status quo ante and think that the tension in the relationship is just a product of Trump? Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that the, the Trump, the, the Biden folks will, will, will return to the status quo ante. I think, I think they, their folks there in the advising um, Vice President Biden who are, are fairly hawkish actually, and I think have a pretty good idea of, of, of where we are. I think, though, that, you know, one of the problems, for example, if it's President Biden in January and the tariffs are still in place, how does the president walk in and then undo these tariffs and, and get nothing in return for the Chinese? So, I mean, I, I, I look at President Trump as, I mean, he's whatever, he's a historical figure. He has fundamentally changed the, the U.S.-China relationship. And, you know, yeah. obviously Xi Jinping has as well. And so there is there is no going back in terms of the campaign. You know, how much do Americans really care? Every presidential campaign, China is sort of an issue, and there's a lot of talk about it becoming an issue, and then it doesn't really matter. This year, of course, is different because of the pandemic. Um, the other thing that I worry about, and I think that 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 people, you know, I mean, you as you've said, you know, you're you're in you know McCarthy's old seat, right? Which is, yeah. um, which is the Dubious real legacy. <laughs> no, but 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 which is just the real risk of sort of, you know, there has to be a way to have a conversation about the challenges sure. from China that, and, 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 and the, the problems the relationship without bleeding over into sort of a lot of racism, because there, there will be and there have already been incidents of backlash against Asian Americans. And that is something and we, you know, in America, we have a really bad history of racism with Chinese. I mean, we had a, we had a, the, the Chinese Inclusion Act. We had a law in the books for that for decades it did let Chinese come in the country. And, you know, it was 100 years ago or less than 100 years ago that we that we got rid of it. And so it's just something that this this it could get ugly. Um, and so that's something that I hope I hope we'll be able to have a rational, smart conversation about China without sort of going too far. I'm not optimistic. Because right, Just I mean, the on political the, environment. Well, and then on the on the on the Biden side, right, if Biden stuff on China, then a lot of progressive groups like you're racist and you're fanning racism, and yeah. and and there is that risk. But but there has to be a way to have a rational conversation about the realities, where you're not going to be criticized as being oh you're racist too hard on China, but at the same time, then you're not like soft on China, right? And and you know, again, I'm a, I'm not I'm I'm not in politics. Maybe it's impossible. I don't know. I mean, I I would like to think that there's ways to. Um, to thread that needle because we have to thread that needle. I mean, at the end of the day, this is, this is, you know, this, this challenge with China is, is, you know, I, it's going to be a challenge for my kids when they're my Definitely. age. Right. And, and, and it so, should transcend party. I mean, it's, it's about it's, the country. It should. About, it should. Yeah. Okay. So let's do some fun stuff before we close out. What is, I've been looking at that, uh, those bottles of liquor on your top shelf behind you. And I'm curious, is that whiskey? But it almost whiskey. looks like a Japanese whiskey, not yeah, a Jap okay. Japanese whiskey. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah Japan yeah. has like great whiskey. I, it's they do. Is it? And I was lucky. I got some when I when I was when we were living in China. I traveled back and forth a lot and um, was able to do some good duty free. So um, it's too expensive now, but it was it was it was relatively cheap five or six years ago. 
I believe a, a, a carefully concealed bottle of Blanton's too next to it as well. You have a good, you have a good high. That's, hey, this is trained this observer. Is so, so not, I'm not an alcoholic, but when I was a kid, I collected beer cans. I don't know if anyone remembers you're, this. Hey, you're talking to Wisconsinites here. This is a friendly audience do, for this conference. Do you do you ever remember this beer? No, what is that? So this is Billy. This was Jimmy Carter's brother's beer, Billy beer. <laughs> so, so I actually, I think I got this and I was like eight or nine years, maybe I was like 10 years old, right? It was the, Before uh, my time. Uh, and it's like steel, right? It's, it's Okay. So given that you spent so much of your day compiling the cynicism newsletter and reading about China stuff, I assume you want to break from that at the end of the day. What sort of non-China related stuff do you read? Do you read fiction? Have you read anything fun during the shutdown? Um... I've or watched. I've watched. Yeah. I like Bosch. You know Bosch on Amazon Prime. I do like Bosch. Yes. Yeah. So I I, I absorb that. Um, the uh, you know we have a puppy. I don't know. A lot of us is trying to get outside and and reading. Yeah. Like uh, I think right now I'm reading. There's a new book by David Ignatius, uh, which I just started. He actually you know the oh, Washington yeah, yeah. Post. He actually yeah, writes yeah. pretty good fiction. The uh, trying to think. It's it's. I got to be honest with you. Um, Nothing. By the time I'm done with the newsletter and like dinner and the kids, it's it's usually uh, I go I, I go to bed at nine o'clock. I get up I, at, I get up at five. I go to bed at nine o'clock. So it's actually kind of boring. We're on the same schedule. We are on the same <laughs> schedule. What would be if someone who's a non-specialist is interested in learning more about China beyond subscribing to cynicism? Are there some books you think are useful entry points, or who would you direct them to? Oh, that's a, it's, that's a, so, so I would, um, I still think if you want to eat like a relatively easy entry into the communist party, you want to read Richard McGregor's book, the party, uh, which okay. he wrote like 10 years ago. Um, and it, it's, it's a very good look sort of at, at how the, the communist party works and, and things have changed, but not that much. Um, trying to think what I have back here, you know, there's a good new book, um, that just came out. Sorry, um, by the Wall Street Journal reporters, Bob Davis and Ling Ling Wei about the uh, trade war. So oh, like yeah, yeah. Like Superpower yeah. showdown. Superpower, yeah. Showdown. And so that actually will get you up to speed about what's been happening over the last couple of years quite quickly. Awesome. And then, of course, watch Wolf Warrior 1 and 2. On, the, on you know, those actually, I think they're on Netflix, right? They're actually, they're actually not, like, at least Wolf Warrior 1 was, was sort of entertaining. They're, it, they're, about as subtle as a, Mike, as a Michael Bay movie. No. But, <laughs> although and, Michael you know, Bay guy, edited Transformers to be more friendly to the Chai Coms, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, they all do. They, I mean, you, you yeah. can't, you, 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 that's why, for example, I used to joke, like, I would, I would love to, like, figure out how to write fiction. And we joking, like, where's the Tom Clancy for China, right? Because you remember Tom Clancy, you know, made his, made his mark and his fortune writing about the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And the answer is, there won't be one in terms of that level of, of sort of wealth creation because Hollywood will never make the movie. Yes. Because, right. right? No, but it's true. And maybe that will change, right? If, if, but, but because, again, this is, this is a, another bit of sort of where China is able to shape the discussion about China globally totally. because no Hollywood movie with any significant budget will put anything in there that's going to piss off Beijing. It's remarkable. We need to fix that. And I, I quite, I don't quite know how, because it's, so, it's purely, so yeah. Here's a question. Sorry, as to, to a representative, which is, I've always wondered, especially in the like Republican controlled chambers, why haven't they called up the Hollywood executives to testify under oath because they tend to always be democratic fund donors. So it seemed like it'd be sort of an easy win for the Republicans to basically get up there and grill them about why, like what exactly do you do with China? You know, Bill, that is a I'm great naive, idea that I, <laughs> that I'm going to steal. And I just want this podcast. We're going to put Tom Cruise on notice. You're coming to Congress to talk about Maverick's jacket in, in Top Gun Maverick, I want to know what happened. And whoever produced Red Dawn remake, that person's coming too. This, I like this, Bill. We're gonna get on this. Uh, I'm in trouble now. Oh. That, that's, <laughs> you're and not just gonna so get you know, invited it, to any of Tom Cruise's parties. And, and just say so that you, know, you can ask your Australian parliamentary friend, but uh, parliamentarian friend. But I, I, um, 
my new favorite term, and I'm, I apologize if this is a little, um, the language is inappropriate, but my new favorite term for the wolf warriors that I heard out of Australia is the wolf wankers. So <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, okay, fi- final question, Bill. Uh, for you, let's say you come to Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, to visit me. Uh, we're going out for for a beer, and uh, a young uh, Wisconsinite comes up to you and says, "Mr. Bishop, I'm a huge fan of cynicism. I want to pursue. I want to learn Mandarin. I want to pursue a career in, you know, China policy. What advice would you have for that young Wisconsinite?" Um, so I would say you got to learn language is important. Um, I would say at this point, consider going to Taiwan to learn language. Um, you know, you, 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 and I would also, um, yes, other than subscribe, no, I'm, I, I think that for me, it, it really, if you have the, the time and you can afford it, learning the language is really important and getting that. And, and the problem right now, though, and I, I was very lucky because I spent a lot of time in China and I spent spent a lot of that time in periods when it was a lot more open. The problem now is it's increasingly harder to actually spend time in China and not. Um, and and it, it's especially on the policy side, I think if you come back to D.C. and you have spent a lot of time in China, there's actually some concerns about um sort of background issues. Interesting. Interesting. I, mean, I was, I was makes- never, never in the government. When I came back, I, you know, I had a lot of readers in the government, and one of them, or actually a couple of them said, yeah, don't ever apply for security clearance. You'll never get one. <laughs> you spent too much time in China. And, you know, the, the, the reality is, is, I'll be honest with you, some of my friends in Beijing, I couldn't actually tell you what they really do. Interesting. Really interesting. Well, Bill, this has been amazing, uh, very helpful for me, and uh, I do genuinely want to say that uh, I went from subscribing to maybe 10 listservs every day and then realizing I wasn't reading all of them and it was just giving me a bunch of information I didn't need to subscribing to uh, one and reading one and it's cynicism because what you're putting out there is really phenomenal product. So thank you as, as someone who's just trying to understand these issues for uh, the work you. you and your team do every day. It's it's incredibly helpful uh, and I know it has a huge influence. So thank you for taking the time. This has uh, been great. Thanks. No, thank you, and I uh, hope uh, someday we can meet in person when everything gets uh, when gets it's back. allowed. When it's allowed again, hey, we'll go. We'll go see uh, 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 Top Gun Maverick. You know, we we can watch <laughs> the censorship play out in person. When does that open, by the way? I you have know? no idea. Right. I have no thank idea. You. Thank All you. Right, thanks, Bill. This is awesome. Yes. Thank you.